I said, okay, you can change it once a year. And that for those students who talked about the general ed changing, I almost think that's criminal. To get a student started and then get them down a path and then change it on. So there, you have to have all four aspects. You have to have the map. You have to have academic policies that go with the map. You need advising policies that go with it. And you need to communicate, communicate, communicate. You would think with social media and everything that it would be easy to communicate. You know it's not. Try and communicate something to students. It just doesn't happen. So um, don't complicate the process. You know, decide on a format. We did pencil and paper. You know, we entered from the catalog. It was pretty easy. We entered all the major classes. Then we went back and um, mapped the general education courses and mapped, looked for where major courses would also fulfill, like in the sciences, all the math general ed are always fulfilled by those other courses. And uh, we kept the running tally, and I'll talk about this in a minute, a running tally of milestones. And the reason you do that is you're going to find out, like we did, like 20-some departments require algebra in the first semester. Well, that would be like 12,000 seats we needed. So we eventually, this is the map and the program we agreed to at Florida State University working with faculty center. So at the top, it tells you how to read your map. On the left is your sample schedule. On the right are the milestone courses that you must complete in that term. And then at the bottom are all of the uh, job employment opportunities if you graduate with that degree. It's a very simple process. What I wanted, <laughs> um, that if a student registered and didn't put the milestone in, I wanted them kicked out, not of school, but out of, out of registration. And they're, oh, you know, that's going to be a nightmare. So instead, what happens, which I don't agree with, but um, when they register, if they don't take the milestone, the advisor gets that. And that, that student then is contacted immediately. Come on in, let's talk about it. The other thing that I think is real important, we don't let students churn. That is, they get two chances at a milestone class to pass it, or two chances to take it in that term, then they change majors. And I'll, if you, um, I should have pointed it out, but the slide on excess hours, only 6% of excess hours uh, originated by changing majors. Changing majors is not a big source of excess hours compared to all the others. You can. Uh, UNC Charlotte takes a slightly different approach. They call them progression courses. Now, I wanted 15 hours a term. And I got pushed back, especially from uh, student affairs and some advisors. Oh, we can't do that. Our students work. I said, you know, that's a testable hypothesis. Let's just test it. So I took our big database, went down to the labor department, and said, I got these broken down by freshman, sophomore, et cetera. Um, they wouldn't obviously give me personal information, but how about clustering them for me? Not employed at all, or you know, under 15 hours, 15 to 20, et cetera. Um, of our freshmen, 60% did not work one single hour a week. Zero. There is no reason why they weren't taking 15 hours. Only about 5% of our students were really stressed, that is, working a lot. And I wish we would have had their names because those are the kinds of students that we can contact because we did lots of things. If you work on campus, about a 1.8% improvement in retention and graduation. If you live on campus and are high risk, 8.8%. And all of these, I, we matched around. Georgia State did some of the same things. Arizona State, San Diego State. So these aren't um, Programs only work on one campus. They worked in a lot of different campuses. Georgia State is inner city, commuter, transfer. We are rural, mostly residential. The exact same things work. The um, whoops. Um, Sinclair Community College takes a slightly different approach. They meet, the student meets with the advisor, and they agree on what area they're going to um, be in. And then that's preloaded. Once the student hits the button, accept the map, then the student then um, selects the times that meet their schedule. 
So the courses are preloaded, and then the students select sections at different times that allows them to take it. And they have a, a, a cute video, the website is there, um, walking them through it. At CUNY, um, I like the approach, and, I, and I've read a lot of the literature on nudge and uh, the art of choosing and irrational decisions about narrowing down options for students. And so at CUNY, there are areas you can see it's nursing, um, business, some, uh, something else, education. Those are preloaded. And there are about 25 of them. Once the student hits that, their schedule is done, and they have to then pick the sections that meet their time. Um, Florida Atlantic, I mean, Florida International University takes a two step process. The first step is um, using a commercial product, the student goes through a little exercise and has to choose an area or a particular major. Once they've done that, then it bounces them to um, their schedule. And they have taken something that Austin um, P pioneered and, and really started, and that's predictive analytics. What they did is they took, um, at FIU, there's I think five companies now that offer software that does this and others. And they took every student that graduated, say, this is chemistry, every student who graduated in chemistry, and then they went back and said, what was their grade in, in Chem 1046? If they didn't earn a B in Chem 1046, they only had about a 20% chance of graduating in chemistry. So they can tell the students up front, this is a critical course, and if you don't earn a B in this course, you're lowering your chances of graduating, and I think that helps the student put some pressure on them to work a little harder in that class. Could you move that forward for me? It doesn't seem to like me. <laughs> um, Chipola College ha um, offers a limited number of four-year degrees, and when students come in, they offer them a transfer program that they have already worked with all the other institutions to guarantee those courses transfer and the student will roll right into whatever major. This is an information studies. Now, I mean, I, um, I was a little bit late going to college. Um, I had a good job as a machinist and, the, you know, talk about motivation. You know, it wasn't air conditioned and we worked a lot of hours. Um, and so I started at community college and like a lot of students, um, I took 15 hours of just <laughs> random courses, and I thought, well, you know, I have all this free time, you know, catch up toward the end of the week, and three weeks into the class, or four weeks, I was so far behind, I just walked away, and I couldn't, couldn't take the stress. And um, I didn't know you could go to the dean and wine and get a withdrawal, <laughs> you know? And so I had to dig out of 15 hours of F's, and I did some uh, tutoring, and I've met a lot of students just like me, they fall behind, and they just blow it off. <laughs> yeah. um, this is the reason that you want to keep a running tally of the milestone courses. You can see there's um, just this group is, a, I need over 3,000 seats. And there's about 10 other programs that require it. Um, you know, the state of Georgia, for instance, asked their mathematicians, do all of these students really need algebra? And uh, they said, no. They only need algebra if they're going to take calculus. Why don't you put them into a quantitative reasoning or a statistics class instead? Because if you run, which I do every term, the high DF courses, high enrollment, algebra is on every one. It's been on every campus I've ever visited. So this allows you to see where the students are. And you know, by lower division students, how many you need. And you place all of your academic maps together somewhere that's conspicuous. I know this stuff. I know that Florida International has this thing called my map. Why did it take me 15 minutes to find the damn thing? And that's true. Oh, for, I don't know why we hide it from students, but you would think it would be a big button on the, on the front of the page. This is your path to success. But instead, I have not found a single campus that it doesn't take a while to find out where they are. We like them all together so students could compare. They're alphabetical because students often don't know what, made, uh, what college they're in. And this allows students to compare both the classes and the employment opportunities. 
So what are the key academic policies? You have to choose a major or an area out of the box. And if you haven't got a major, we do choosing your major workshops. And these are run by academic advisors and students like the ones we had this morning, seniors in their area, and they run them usually on weekends. But you have to go to that until you get a major. Faculty are invited, faculty often come, but students want to hear from students about what that major looks like. Um, those milestone courses, and you've got to do something um, if you haven't done it. I've not been successful in rationalizing general ed, but last year, the legis Florida legislature, who um, does many more laws in higher education than you all ever dreamed of, said, we're tired of looking at these 200 credits. You're going to have five areas in general ed, five courses to choose from in each area, and every institution in the state will offer the exact same courses. And that passed and kicks in um, next fall, and they got around accreditation by mandating the faculty to do it. So the faculty groups had to get together, and it's pretty much done now. Oops. The key advising policy. So the advisors have to work with students on choosing a major. They are in constant contact with students. If that student hasn't either made the grade or registered for the milestone, there is, they get flooded with messages. What, what has surprised me is how many students will give their, make a friend of their advisor. So they, um, Facebook, that, they use a lot of Facebook and texting as well as email to tell the student, you didn't take a class that you need to, there's a lot of consequences with money and other, come in and see me. Then, um, I don't think you can communicate enough. The message is, a degree is either a two or a four year process. It shouldn't be as long as it is. Maps uh, at every orientation, at every packet with parents, students, and faculty, there are maps in it. Every time there's a conversation with a student and the advisor, there's maps with it. It just is trying to build that over and over again. We've given you a clear path to graduation, let's do it. I guarantee you, think about at Florida State, I think our tuition, which is relatively low, has gotten out of control. Um, it's increased so quickly. By the time you add fees, we went from $1,800 a year to $6,000 a year in a blink. And then you add room and board. It's about $21,000, $22,000 a year. So every year that student stays in school longer, that's a lot of money. So they save time and money. They avoid the unnecessary courses. They always know where they are and where they're going. And my conversations with our focus groups is students often weren't sure where they were going, what they needed to do to graduate. Now, the institutions, I think, benefit hugely. Departments know exactly how many majors they, are, they have, where they are in the sequence, what courses will be needed the next term. The registrar can then schedule classrooms. Faculty can plan in the future. They don't get blindsided by having to cover a section at the last minute because you know how many are needed. And advisors can be effectively utilized. It's a big game. The, um, when we started, we had 7,382 with a 70% graduation rate. We got that down to about 1,500, and we started adding both improvements in retention and in graduation. So by the, um, over time now, this looks like a long time frame. That's because I made a lot of mistakes along the way that you don't have to make. But what happened is, in 99, when we started putting in academic maps, it started actually in 96, but no one paid attention to them too much. Um, but you can see that it started improving the graduation rate, and the retention rate went from 82 to a, a very good 92%. We started making a lot of money by increasing tuition collection, and this big bump here, right in, well, the big bump there, we decided to add advisors. So we wanted to get under 300 students per advisor. So we hired new advisors. We trained them centrally, very detailed training, and then sent them to the library from Sunday night to Thursday night and into academic departments. So if you saw an advisor in an academic department, they were experts in general ed, experts in that field, 
and then they would be trained across a wide variety of areas. It's enormously positive, and we made an astounding 